Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists... Today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Michael Sheets, from the University of Texas Medical and Branch in Galveston, and beyond talking about membranes, molecular motors and motility, he also tells us about what exciting new data on cell senescence. I hadn't done anything on cell senescence. Uh, and we were at the time using ultrasound to kill tumor cells, something which we happened upon uh, in the latter days uh, in Singapore. And uh, so I said, well, try ultrasound on these senescent cells. And he found that the senescence was reversed. We discuss how living in different parts of the world made him adapt his hobbies and exercise routines. We ended up doing a lot of tennis, but you really had to be out there as the sun came up. I mean, Singapore's on the equator, basically, two-tenths of a degree off. And so the temperature almost never changes significantly. And he leaves us with some great scientific and life advice. Doing Approaching those aspects which you are enthused about and where you can feel like that's what I want to do. And when you start out and try it, you like doing it. All on this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole and welcome to the Microscopist today. Today I'm joined by Michael Sheets of the University of Texas Medical Branch and I need to slow down. <laughs> so, Michael, how are you today? Fine, thank you. Uh, Mike, thank you for joining me today. I've got to say, <clears throat> there's some guests that you think of and there's some guests you wait on and <clears throat> you've been an inspiration to me since my PhD days. Uh, and actually, I, I was studying spectrin and spectrin lipid interactions oh, yeah. and the diffusion of the membrane through the side skeleton. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, last night I thought, come on, I know I've got Mike's work cited in my uh, my thesis. And actually, I, I, I went, I, I found my thesis, which was a challenge. And okay. actually, I managed to find a couple of your publications that were cited Great. within it. Wonderful. Uh, so nice. look at it. I think it was glycophorin A with it. Uh, we were actually measuring band three diffusion, uh, which is the anion channel in the red blood yep. cell. So, right. Which, of course, spectrin also anchors or anchored to. Uh, well, a portion of it uh, is attached indirectly to uh, spectrin, but uh, the majority of it is freely diffusing. <clears throat> and that, that, yeah, that was a large part of the thesis. And the part of it, and looking at the, the see how I guess to look at how the protein was also limiting diffusion, not because of binding necessarily, but indirect lipid interactions, uh, and how well, that could correct. Uh, I mean, it, it's been followed up by a number of uh, people, Kasumi and others, to look at the diffusion within the corral. So in other words, the spectrin binds to the membrane and because it's a long, uh, essentially fibrous protein, it can form a corral or uh, a, an enclosed area of the plasma membrane. And within that, the band three will diffuse, but it won't go over long distances and so uh, if you have, and uh, he's looked at this with essentially uh, super resolution microscopy, and you see the diffusion in the, the corral, but not between corrals. So, yeah. And, and that, this, I guess these are the days when super resolution wasn't termed either and doing single right. particle tracking. Uh, so I was with Richard Cherry at the time. Oh, uh, okay. Sure, I know. Remember Richard? Yes. Yeah. So it's uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was, it was good times, PhD days. But anyway, we were actually, when when would you say was the best time in your career? 
Well, I have to say that uh, the recent work that we're doing has uh, really excited me. Uh, since we've come, since I've moved to Galveston, a new postdoc came into the lab who had been studying senescence. And I hadn't done anything on cell senescence. Uh, and we were at the time using ultrasound to kill tumor cells, something which we happened upon uh, in the latter days uh, in Singapore. And uh, so I said, well, try ultrasound on these senescent cells. And he found that the senescence was reversed and the cells would now grow, lose the other phenotypes associated with senescence, the beta galactosidase uh, expression, uh, secretion of uh, senescence associated secretory products, uh, and um, they shrunk in size. So uh, we've been playing with this a lot. We took it to mice and uh, in aged mice who are 22 to 24 months old, their lifespan is two years. Uh, they become rejuvenated. Their physical performance on treadmill and a, a inverted cling assay uh, is significantly improved by simply a half hour treatment with ultrasound every third day for a month. So um, this has a lot of implications. We can take mesenchymal stem cells, expand them well beyond what is the hayflick limit or the normal replication limit, and they will still differentiate properly. So it seems that this way of rejuvenation uh, is harmless and uh, will enable us to do a variety of interesting things. We're do, applying for clinical trials uh, to look at diabetic foot ulcers, and soon we'll do whole body treatments to see if the humans behave similar to the mice. Uh, that answers my next question, whether it was targeted or whole body. And it sounds like currently it's targeted. Right. And with the mice, uh, they are put in a bath above the ultrasonic generator uh, and move around in that ultrasound field. They need to be wet for the ultrasound to uh, penetrate their body but we're using low frequency ultrasound, which doesn't cause heating and uh, which will penetrate the whole human body, uh, even bones to an extent. And so we're um, really excited about the possible implications of this uh, in terms of clinical trials and downstream applications to humans. So thank you. It sounds great, but the thought of uh, my swimming pool getting busier is this is one of the benefits you could have at the same time. I, 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 busy enough as it is. <laughs> so that's so, so, so right now is probably the most exciting time of your career, which is, I think, amazing because your career has been hugely illustrious uh, over the time. <clears throat> and I, I guess, so, so I, I know you from your your membrane diffusion and lipid mm -hmm. diffusion, membrane diffusion type work. But of course, you're also on the joint discoveries of kinesin. Right. <clears throat> well, which, which is fundamentally vital and looking at the myosin movements as well uh, at, at nanometer precision. <clears throat> Lucky or inspired or how, how did you... Did, to, to be honest, well, I sort of describe it as a, uh, a random walk, indeed, uh, which I guess implies luck. I mean, the latest results I was just talking about were occasioned by hiring a new postdoc. Uh, we had the ultrasound around. I told him to take the senescent cells and put them on there and see what happens. And he got this remarkable result.
you know, these are not things that you planned beforehand, uh, but you notice something unusual and it's those unusual quote unquote unexpected results, which uh, often turn out to be the most significant and, and important to follow up on. So my career has, has not led a linear path. It's been sort of a, a random walk itself. Uh, we moved on from membranes to motors and moved from there to uh, integrins and adhesions uh, and uh, cell motility in that regard. Moved from there to rigidity sensing and uh, the rigidity sensor, it seems, as we describe it, it's an early uh, activity of the cells pinching the matrix uh, and thereby measuring the rigidity of the matrix. They pull to a constant distance and then the force is proportional to the rigidity. Uh, and that activity is missing in virtually all the tumor cells that we've looked at. And when we stretch those tumor cells, unlike normal cells, which uh, can grow on soft surfaces when you stretch them, the tumor cells on soft surfaces die when you stretch them. And that led us to ultrasound, which you know, then led us to uh, looking at aging. So, <laughs> so you say, Get the, uh, your career has been a random walk. It's been very bio orientated from the start. If I take yeah. you back to when you were a child, maybe 10, 12, at that point, what did you want to be at that point as a career? Well, I grew up in, my dad was a uh, chemist. Okay. And I grew up in Midland, Michigan, which is the home of Dow Chemical Company. And so I was influenced by science a lot. Uh, at that age, I was, um, let's see, into, uh, was interested in mathematics as well as chemistry and science in general. So, uh, and it, it was a science family, so it naturally led uh, to that. Yeah. But, but that sounds more chemistry orientated than, than biology or biochemistry, biophysics? Sure. Um, <laughs> when I was, uh, you know, a senior in high school, my parents wanted me to go on to medical school and uh, tried to convince me through my college career that medical school was uh, the important thing to do. My dad, uh, philosophized about things and said that, you know, he worked for Dow and he developed these products. It took five to 10 years to get those products to market. And so there was a lot of very delayed gratification. He said, well, you know, you, your doctor, you treat the patient, the patient gets well, often right away with the drug that you give them, and you get instant gratification. So it's you know, much more gratifying to be a doctor than it is to be a, a chemist and in, industrial chemist. Okay. So, uh, and from my own point of view, I, I went and served one summer as an, uh, uh, in a hospital as an orderly. And that sort of convinced me that, uh, the MDs don't know what they were doing, but it worked type of issue. Yeah. Okay. And that really the basis was much more in the biochemistry and so forth. And I decided to take that route and um, have not regretted it. Let's put it that way. So, uh, and if you look at your current research, of all the research, the impact may be <clears throat> not immediate, so you don't get that immediate gratification. Right. But every doctor may be able to use it. Uh, whereas before you'd have been one doctor using someone else, but you are creating, the impact potential is much greater, I would argue, what you're doing now. Well, uh, I feel that likewise. I mean, it's a matter that um, 
you know, if you want to make a change in the system, it's not going to be on the day-to-day -day basis and doing things in the system. It's by taking a look at the fundamental issues. And then when we get a better fundamental understanding, uh, it's easier to make some major changes. I mean, from our point of view, the I went over to Singapore to set up this mechanobiology institute there. And we had been doing a lot of work on sort of the mechanical aspects of cells. And it was clear that we knew very little of what that really meant. Okay. I mean, the argument that I make is that uh, 30 micron or 40 micron cells create the total form of the organism. And they do so reproducibly in almost a deterministic fashion. You look at uh, these birds of paradise, for example, and you know, two of those birds look extremely similar. And yet, all of the events that led to their formation were performed by isothermal diffusion in the cells that formed them. So those cells must have a means of knowing where they are in the overall body plan and what they must do to create the proper shape of the organism. I, I, I've lost my train of thought there. So obviously you're just taking it to a different direction just while I was going with it. Um, sure. So you're, no, so you're, I, I, I guess question I quite often ask is where you wanted to be as a child. We've got there and you've gone through. And I, th I think I know the answer already. Today, do you wish you'd ever done a different career to what you had chosen? Um, Honestly, no. I mean, it, there were days when things did not work and where one felt that, uh, you know, uh, was I ever going to accomplish anything that was significant and so forth. Um, but in the end, you know, I'm very happy and feel very lucky and fortunate uh, to have gone down this path. Okay. And, it's and not I wouldn't easy. have known how to do that beforehand. I say it has uh, not only has your research been sort of a wandering path, but your way where, where you've actually worked has also moved between different places. You, you haven't been. I mean, some people do their postgraduate and then they move somewhere and they stay somewhere for a long, long time. Right. <clears throat> but actually, you've had quite, some quite big changes. Uh, and quite big influences to, to the different places you've been. I, I think if my facts are right, I don't usually do much research, but I did do a little bit, that you were at Duke uh, to the yeah. University uh, Medical School and the Chair of Cell Biology there for 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, where obviously some of the publications that I was looking at uh, were from. You were uh, then Columbia, was it Columbia University before or after that? After that. After that. And then, of course, you mentioned you then went to uh, NUS, so you, uh, mm -hmm. National University of Singapore. Right. <clears throat> to set up the new Mechanobiology Institute. <clears throat> oh, can I ask this? Where is your favourite place to work? Uh, the place which I felt was best organised for research was Washington University in St. Louis where I worked before going to Duke. Okay. I was only there for five years, but uh, it was an extremely well-run university. Uh, and it was in essence run by the departmental chairs who appointed the dean uh, annually. Often the dean stayed on, but yeah. uh, he was serving at the request of the chairs. So uh, yeah, that uh it was no nonsense they had you know online ordering this is now 85 to 90 
uh, uh, well before other institutions, et cetera, et cetera. So did, did you learn many tricks from that uh, when you went over to Singapore to set up the Institute? Well, the Singapore Institute was set up with the idea of providing central services and uh, an open lab environment. And we had enough funds to have uh, lab mothers, so to speak, uh, who saw that uh, you know, all the basics were ordered, that people didn't get unruly and that the you know, local lab squabbles were settled, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, because it was an open lab situation, uh, there was a lot of communication. So any technological developments were rapidly shared uh, and it was a, a really great environment. And did you find any, so how did your research go with that? Because there's a lot of effort setting that up with the infrastructure, leading it. Mm -hmm. Did your research keep going well at that time? Yeah, I mean, it, it went fine because the... My job was to, you know, sort of see that once this was set up, it would continue to run well. Uh, and that was an administrative duty that took maybe 20 to 30% of one's time. Uh, the rest of the time though was devoted to uh, supporting the students and postdocs. And you sent me one picture. Uh, yeah which is you actually in the lab. Right. How often do you get in the lab? Well, uh, less now, obviously, than in the past. I worked at the bench, uh, you know, up until the time I moved to St. Louis. Uh, and then after that, I was departmental chair. So those administrative duties sort of precluded uh, my own lab time. Okay. It looks like a very organized lab as well. Just looking at all the bottles that are nicely lined up behind. Uh, well, uh, yeah, this, um, yeah, I can't say that uh, all the people in my lab were so organized, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> and so I, I don't, um, let's say, enforce order uh, in the lab, it's pretty much laissez-faire. Uh, and if the person succeeds in my lab, they will usually succeed elsewhere. So that, that's certainly been a rule of thumb. And what, what was it like moving from the US to Singapore? Were there big challenges with that? Um, in a sense, no, because they, we had sort of... Um, elevated status there. And so once we hired these people to, in essence, uh, do the day-to-day -day lab work and do the ordering and so forth, uh, my position was really to see that uh, good science was being done and that we brought in, you know, good speakers, for example, and that uh, we, we recruited good people. And so all of that um, could go on just fine and the labs were running well. Yeah. <clears throat> but what about uh, outside of the lab? Because I, the climate is different. I, I, I've only been to Singapore once, <laughs> actually over oh. to, uh, into the NUS side actually with a, oh, there's a Zeiss meeting over there I was talking about the Aries scan um, right. some years ago. And I, I certainly remember the weather going from hot to the most torrential downpours uh, right. and the amazing infrastructure. The roads just dried up and it just where the water went, it just sheds the water really fast. But <clears throat> that must have been, again, something different. Just, you know, you're more limited in what you can do activity wise. Uh, yeah, I mean, my wife and I uh, both like to do exercise every day. 
And over there, uh, we ended up doing a lot of tennis, but you really had to be out there as the sun came up. I mean, Singapore's on the equator, basically two tenths of a degree off. And so the temperature almost never changes significantly. And the uh, day span, daylight hours don't change. Sun comes up at seven, goes down at seven. It's on eternal daylight savings time. Uh, and so you want to be out on the tennis courts at seven o'clock. Uh, and then by 8.30 or so, so after you've shed uh, two to four pounds of, of water, uh, you go back and rehydrate. So that's that's basic routine. Are you still keeping up the tennis now that you're back in the U.S.? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and over there, I, I, I noticed your mug that you were drinking from early before we started had a uh, some birds on it so he's birding another part of your hobbies yeah well my wife is a, a big birder and uh so after we got together you know going out uh i didn't really like the binoculars just looking at the birds and decided i was interested in photography more uh and so bought a large lens and uh, we went on safari as well as to Papua New Guinea. Uh, and it was a lot of fun just really trying to capture uh, the birds in various poses, etc. So uh, that's been a big pleasure. It's, it's not the easiest of tasks. So it's just, I've, I've, I digiscope a little bit. Uh, I've been known to digiscope quite a lot in the past. I, I've got to ask, having, having just recently got through a ton of pictures how do you choose which ones to keep and which ones to delete and how efficient are you at doing that i'm not all that efficient um i mean it's uh, it's a creative process in that uh often uh if you the picture fits the criteria of being in focus uh then you have the issue of color adjustment and uh, cropping and so forth that um, come into play. Uh, I ran into at one point a National Geographic photographer who gave me the, the one third rule, which is that uh, the bird should not be in the center of the photo, but should be essentially one third off and off, you know, in facing in the larger direction. Okay. And so that, that's a very helpful tool. And uh, you, know, you try to do everything along that line. And I really enjoy the editing of the photos. Um, I get started on that process and it's one which uh, often takes more time than I had allotted for it type of thing. Is that Anyways. Photoshop you're using for that? Uh, Lightroom. Okay. But I mean, it, it goes back to the issue with students of them trying to choose an area to go into. And I often emphasize with them that uh, you want to go into those areas where you are enthused, where, you know, you want to go and do that work. And often that uh, the work, once you're absorbed in it, other things fall away. So um, rather than, you know, constantly looking at your watch, wondering when, when will this be over and when can I leave, you know, type of situation. So, uh, and I think that's important for, for people. And as long as it's only the, uh, your bird photos that you're uh, editing, and not the uh, the scientific the microscope images that you're requiring <laughs> that, that that you're editing. Uh, I have to remember the one third rule though. I, I guess when we're framing our cells on the microscope, maybe we should just make sure the cell of interest is always one third to the side. <laughs> Something like that. I mean, particularly if the person is looking the other way. So the eye tends to go where the person is looking. Let's put that. 
And th thinking back to the microscopy, uh, obviously a lot of your early, early studies were very heavily microscopy right. based. Uh, what, what is your favorite microscope technique? I mean, the one that um, I find very dynamic and one which has fallen out of favor uh, is uh, video enhanced differential interference contrast, okay, which enables one to monitor uh, objects moving within the cell and you get a, a real feel for uh, how dynamic the cytoplasm is under those circumstances. Uh, using super resolution, we invested heavily in uh, super resolution microscopes when we started the Institute in Singapore, but it was really only toward the end of the time there in 2018, 2019, uh, when people really started using super resolution. And uh, the problems had to, you know, grow to that level. Okay. And once you understood basics, then you want to know the details of what's in this complex, uh, how might it be moving, and how dynamic is it. And super resolution microscopy can uh, help solve a lot of those problems. So. Would you say it was just waiting for the question to grow into the technology? Or do you think also the fact that I think a lot of the commercial companies made the technology far more accessible to a non-specialist microscopist to be able to use to solve their biological questions? Well, I think um, it, the, you know, I'm a great believer in hypothesis-driven science. And so, uh, Indeed, the uh, ability to see things in the light microscope at the level of, uh, let's say, doing video, I mean, uh, super resolution confocal microscopy gives you about 100 nanometer resolution. And so that's the size of a lot of the smaller vesicles and larger protein complexes. So you can, you know, hope to follow those movements in real time and understand in a physiological environment what is going on. So, um, and that I think uh, raises a lot of questions, enables one to really take hypotheses about how this is actually functioning and to uh, prove or disprove those ideas. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I love the, uh, the favorite technique that you had. I, I've got to say, certainly from back watching some of your early work, FRAP was certainly one of my favorite techniques for looking at sort of the diffusion side of mm -hmm. things. Uh, some quick fire questions for you. Uh, would you say you're a night owl or an early bird? Uh, now I've been become uh, an early bird because, you know, I'm in Galveston, which has a, a climate, at least right now, very similar to Singapore. It does have winter and we've been through a freeze here, but uh, most of the year or six months plus of the year, it's quite hot. So I've become an early bird. The old days, uh, when I was in the lab, I was often working at night, did most of my thesis work uh, from, you know, eight o'clock on and would often not get home until one or two in the morning. So yeah. <clears throat> they were long stints. Uh, but it doesn't surprise me. So you're still playing tennis first thing in the morning then? Oh, I, I only took up tennis uh because my wife was interested in it, so so what did you do before you said you've always been keen on keeping fit exercise uh well mostly running used to run quite a bit every other day at least uh back in in duke and before I and what was, was your running. distance oh 
typically three to four miles, uh, three to five miles, depending upon yeah. the day type of thing. So between the 5K and 10K, shorter distances. Okay, PC or Mac? Mac the whole time. Okay, McDonald's or Burger King? Uh, well, haven't been the, the one of those that I've been to most recently is Burger King because they have the impossible burger whopper. What on earth is that? Well, remember, an impossible burger is a uh, plant based product, it's um, basically yeast derived, uh, developed by a chemist at Stanford who found out what gives rise to the meat taste uh, and then expressed those necessary proteins and so forth in yeast. And those yeast now give the flavor to the burger. How was it? Oh, it's good. Yeah. You, you have a hard time differentiating it from uh, a standard meat bur burger. Now I'm going to have to go and try a Burger King, aren't I? Not tonight, yeah. though. That, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, tea or coffee? Coffee. Uh, First thing in the morning, you know, I, I normally end up um, having on the order of four or five cups a day. Are they uh, sort of long, black, white espressos? Uh, espresso derived, and then uh, sometimes I'll, I'll put milk in it, but you know, it doesn't matter much anymore. I can, I can take this <laughs> stuff caffeine. straight. <laughs> Beer or wine? Uh, wine, preferably, yeah. Red or white? Uh, red. So. And chocolate or cheese? Uh, both, actually. Um, I do want to avoid uh, high blood pressure and so forth, so uh, tend more toward... Um, uh you know a lighter aspect of that and often crackers with hummus and things instead of the cheese singapore or usa pardon singapore or usa uh usa i'm i'm an american for a long time i mean singapore uh is a lovely place they did very well by us uh we could we set up the institute there and we wouldn't have been able to do that in the US. We had the money to do it right. Uh, the people we hired over there were extremely good, uh, dedicated and uh, kept that place running. I mean, I had only in 10 years, a handful of personal situations that I had to get involved with. <clears throat> so uh, that that meant that everything was pretty well buffered and pretty well uh, run over there. That said, uh, it's a boring place, and its major attribute, from my point of view, is the airport, which is outstanding. Uh, and you are there two hours to most of Southeast Asia four hours to India, China, and Australia. Yep. So it's easy to get around. And, and a great scientific environment. And a great scientific environment. A lot of people who travel to the Far East will go through Singapore. And so we had no trouble getting good speakers and so forth over there. So, <clears throat> so I, I will come back to the quick fire questions in a minute, because you, you mentioned about you had very few problems when you were over there. When has been the most challenging or difficult time of your career? Um, I would say that uh, my move from uh, 
Duke to Columbia was challenging. Uh, people who were recruited to Duke, it's a rural environment. Uh, life is easy in the South, da 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 da. Uh, and moving to New York is quite the opposite. It's huge, huge metropolitan area. Uh, people with kids don't want to move there, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I basically set up my lab by myself there. I didn't have a crew that came with me to help set it, set it up. So uh, that was challenging. And did you appreciate that that would be the case when you accept a job at Columbia University? Or was that something that only once you'd accepted, you went, oh, OK, this is not going to be quite was, as easy as I thought. Well, I mean, it was largely personal reasons that caused me to move. And so, you know, you accept that. <clears throat> but no regrets? No regrets. I mean, we I was able to recruit a very good cadre of, of people there better than I, I you know, could recruit uh, at Duke. And so uh, uh, things went very well. So it did have its plus. So, so you'll notice it's difficult in who you're recruiting, but what the recruits were very, so it does have its plus points, its positives. Right, right. very much uh, so, yeah. Which is good. So thinking of good times as well, what about uh, your favorite publication that you've either authored or co-authored? Oh, um, well, it's, uh, it's hard. I mean, the to because we've been in so many different areas, uh, and each has its own, you know, uh, essence. Um, I mean, we had the initial paper in the red blood cell area where we took the spectrin deficient mouse erythrocytes and found that diffusion occurred there just fine. Whereas, uh, uh, you know, Cherry, your advisor had measured the uh, rotary diffusion of band three. Yep. And it was the same with or without spectrin, but the lateral diffusion of spectrin was very dependent. Uh, lateral diffusion of band three was yep. very dependent upon spectrin. Well, it was transient dichroism, wasn't it? I think he used for yeah. that rotational diffusion. I remember that rig. Very, very specialist. Right. <laughs> and then working with Ron Vale and uh, Bruce Schnapp and uh, Tom Reese, uh, we discovered the Kinesin motor. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, a lot of fun. And the, uh, the anecdotal story there is that we had uh, put in a paper to Nature saying that uh, it was a, a membrane channel possibly similar to the um, uh, flagellar rotor system because what we saw was that the same vesicle was able to move in essence in two directions on the microtubules. So, uh, and there uh, with the bacterial flagellar rotor, it can change direction quite easily. The paper was reviewed and we had a, a number of little things to take care of uh, to resubmit it. And then I was working with Ron Vale late one night in the lab and he was trying to reconstitute the vesicles with the microtubules and with some supernatant to see if we could reconstitute the vesicle movements. Yeah. And we noted that the vesicle prep that night just didn't work. So we had uh, almost no vesicles just microtubules and supernatant, and the microtubules were attaching to the glass and moving, which indicated that the motor was in the supernatant, 
and that was causing the microtubules to move on the glass. Something which uh, our competitor, Bob Allen, had noted before, but had a totally different explanation for it. So using that microtubule movement assay, uh, we went on to purify kinesin, uh, then from uh, both the squid system and from uh, bovine brain, uh, and it was off to the races. But, uh, you know, I, I can imagine finding, finding kinesia must have been one of those moments when you, when you see it, you find it, you prove it as quite a moment that you'll remember. I presume you remember sure. where you were where in the lab or the office, exactly that moment. Right, right. We were working, this was like 1230 at night. Uh, and, you know, my first words were, oh, shit, uh, because the paper that we had submitted was all bullshit at that point. Uh, and so uh, we never resubmitted that paper. But. <laughs> no, what, what, what a moment. Uh, what? <clears throat> Do you think it was a, a good time to be a scientist, a biochemist at that point for discovery? You know, are there so many unknowns still out there for young biochemists coming through to discover, do you think? Or you know, was it a really good time to be in that position? I mean, certainly we had a, a wonderful time uh, really trying to address motility questions that had not been addressed except by a few people. Uh, in biochemistry, the biochemists were focused on uh, metabolism, uh, proteins, and uh, cell biologists looking at the cytoskeleton and so forth. Uh, but these dynamic questions uh, were much more difficult to address. Okay. I think likewise nowadays, the issue of uh, the problems that I raised in mechanobiology are really daunting in terms of understanding how diffusive motions and basic diffusion processes can be harnessed by a cell to create a essentially deterministic behavior. So, uh, and we have a lot to learn there. Yeah, and I, I, you know, if you think about it, you have the hypothesis, you can test it. It's difficult. There's not, I don't think there's ever that moment of clarity. There's always going to be an interpretation in that area. Right. That, that maybe takes some of that, uh, that, that, that moment of joy. It, it becomes a, a pro prolonged moment of joy that you never reach right. the end of. Right. No, that's um, when things are, are simple and we don't know a lot, then a uh, simple concept of, of, let's say, a motor is something that uh, is quite remarkable. Okay. <clears throat> I would say the, uh, you know, in the recent past, the Doudna and others with CRISPR-Cas9 was, uh, you know, a major fundamental change in our, our understanding. Okay. So, uh, and otherwise, however, we know all the components. And so you can't just take a motor and say that, you know, this is fundamentally blah, 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 and really the thing because you know that there are you know, 30 other motors there. Uh, and so what becomes the description of them? And that's much more complicated. I, I would say without putting anyone off, if you're a young scientist out there thinking this is just sounding harder and harder. But then if we just reflect back to the start of the conversation, and Mike, you were talking about your right. sound work. You know, it's there, isn't it? You know, you still got that that moment of hallelujah very sure. early on. Sure. Uh, so, so it is there, and it's just just the questions are different, and the problems are different, but just as profound. No, I agree, and uh, I think the 
best way to try to address this is uh, either through following up on those unusual results that you hadn't expected. Okay. Because you formulated a model on what you know. And if something doesn't work and comes up with a totally different answer, uh, you throw out that hypothesis and now you try to understand the other. Uh, the other approach that we've used a lot is to do what I call a Friday afternoon or Saturday morning experiment. Based upon the literature, you say, well, if this happens and that happens, then this should work in this way. And if you have a component of uh, what's needed to address that question, and a friend has the other aspect, either a, a bit of machine, you know, tool, uh, a microscope, et cetera, uh, to help address that, then you can put the resources together and come up with a preliminary answer in an afternoon. So, uh, and those experiments don't always work. Uh, but a lot of our, my career has been following up on those that have worked. Would you say more have failed than succeeded on those oh, Friday sure. afternoon, Saturday, Saturday morning? You know, just let's, yeah, I take it you, you're working with friends and you're thinking, actually, why don't we just see what happens if I, if I take my protein, your technology, let's see what happens or combine sure. our study type questions and see if there's anything. Right. Yeah, mine have basically failed. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they've been very fun doing. Right. I mean, the, the, the uh, early on in my career, I was trying to address questions that still have not been addressed. So, for example, uh, one of my early papers was on uh, how red blood cells became echinocytes, the, the projections from the surface, uh, which were driven by... Uh, anionic compounds. And Singer had the idea this was like the bimetallic couple you're causing uh, with the ones that went to the outer half of the bilayer, expansion of that half of the bilayer, and thereby causing curvature. And we basically proved that, uh, and subsequent studies have followed up on that. Now, in the meantime, when I started my lab, we incubated red blood cells with the compounds that would cause the echinocytes to form. And lo and behold, after an hour or so in uh, medium with, with nutrients, they went back to biconcave discs. And if you washed away the compound, uh, they became uh, somatocytic, they had invagination. So clearly the cell was able to sense that change in curvature or change in mm -hmm. half bilayer pressure and had a mechanism biochemically to compensate for that. Uh, and it was dependent upon uh, the pentose phosphate shunt blah, 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 but we never followed up and don't know to this day how that is sensed nor how that uh, actually works. <clears throat> so, now, so, that, so now, for advice of anyone starting out, they're somewhere where they could start out. Sure. Uh, going back to the quick fire questions, we don't have a huge amount of time left. Sure. What would you say is your favorite, do you have a favorite conference that you go to? Uh, I mean, I used to go to cell biology quite regularly. The questions that uh, we're trying to address now have, as I say, taken us uh, into the field of aging. Uh, and so, you know, we're moving to a new set of uh, conferences. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I go back to cell biology, it's usually to catch up with friends and uh, understand what's what's going on there. So. 
Yeah, I, I don't know the senescent field well, but it always sounds a bit sleepy if it's a senescent field. But <laughs> it's just never a good way to word it. Uh, if you go, so you've been invited speaker many times over. What would be the favourite food? So they, usually they'll take you out for dinner, you know, as a keynote oh, sure. speaker. What would be the favourite food that they could put in front of you? And you think, oh, spot on. That's perfect. Well, we certainly enjoy uh, uh, sushi and uh, a lot of the Japanese fare. Okay. Uh, and, uh, but in Europe, I mean, the food is excellent there in Italy, France, etc., Spain. So. so is there any food that actually, when it's put in front of you, thinking, oh, I really wish I didn't have to eat this? Well, it's, it goes back to, um, I mean, I tend to stay away from purely vegetarian dishes, although we, we try to be vegetarian uh, a fair amount. Uh, you know, it, it occasioned a, a drop in my vitamin B12 levels because you get most of your vitamin B12 from meat. So, um, but... Um, yeah, I would say, uh, and you know, for that matter, I don't uh, dislike at all uh, meat. You know, in the sense that I grew up with it, and with putting a steak in front of me is just fine. But uh, it's not something I do regularly. Okay. Uh, I mean, I avoid bad tasting food. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Well, I, I guess that's obvious. Uh, book or TV? Uh, I would say, unfortunately, uh, my wife and I tend to watch the evening news uh, over evening drinks and then segue into one of the mystery or other series that uh, we've been following. So, uh, and. I believe that in the future, I'll be reading more. Let's put it that way. I used to read a lot. So, so on the mystery, on the, on the TV programs, is there anything that uh, you really shouldn't be telling me about that is actually a bit embarrassing, but you're just about to tell me about? What is, what is your worst TV sin? Uh, I mean, we watch a fair amount of Nordic noir. Okay. Uh, and that's that's something we've gone to, and and also the uh, uh, there's a series on. We have a second home in Santa Fe, uh, and Hillerman uh, novels of mystery novels of of, of the Navajos and uh, Indians there are really quite interesting. So there's now a TV series on that. Okay. okay. Um, what about your favorite movie? Uh, I mean, the ones that um, I gravitate to, uh, I mean, we've seen um, mm, I mean, the uh, Lawrence of Arabia is one of the best, I, I find. Wow. See, that starred me. Well, no, it's just my namesake, wasn't it? <laughs> so, so, yeah. Alas, alas, I, 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 I am still alive, unlike the uh, original Peter O'Toole. Uh, okay. Well, we so, went to, to visit uh, Petra and uh, Wadi Rum, uh, and those are really wonderful places. So you get the real feel for the place for uh, Lawrence of Arabia visiting those. And a very cinematic film as well. But, uh, right. Certainly a widescreen viewing. Right. And what about music genre? What sort of music do you like listening to? Uh, primarily classical. You know, we often go to uh, like the Baroque and uh, Santa Fe has a Baroque festival every year. It's just started. We went to a concert there on Monday night uh, and we'll go back to uh, a number when we return uh, in August. 
Sorry. And we are now coming up almost perfectly to the hour mark. So I've got one other question. Do you have any advice to give to anyone starting out their career? I mean, the this is the thing that we talked about earlier, doing, approaching those aspects which you are enthused about and where you can feel like that's what I want to do. And when you start out and try it, you like doing it. Okay. And sometimes what you think you would like to do doesn't turn out to be that, you know, what you really get involved in. But if you think about where you gravitate in that sphere uh, and in that occupation, some people gravitate toward experiments, others gravitate toward theory, uh, you know, follow your body, or follow your mind, I should say. I, I think that's a very good advice. And I think if you look back at many of the other podcasts, such as Scott Fraser, uh, Ernst Dell, so they've, they've certainly had very convoluted roots uh, to where they are today. Even Dan Davis started as a physicist, became an immunologist, and now probably is big and is well known as an author. <clears throat> so it really is follow your passion and what you're good at, I guess. Mike, uh, thank you for being such an inspiration, even though you didn't know it during my PhD days. And uh, thank you for joining me today. And everyone, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. And thank you for everyone who's listened, watched, and please don't forget to subscribe. Uh, but Mike, thank you so much. It's been really wonderful to meet you properly. Nice meeting you as well. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.